Welcome to Ambassador Radio. Welcome to another edition of Ambassador Radio. I'm your host, Justin Bass. I'm an elder at Bass Chapel on Zion Hill Road in Sergornsville, Tennessee. Today, we're going to be looking at a book that arrived last week by Pat Abendroth. He is a pastor in Nebraska, and uh, he's written a book called The Active Obedience of Christ. This is playing off of a quote that I've used many times from the pulpit, and it's from J. Gresham Machen. It says, I am thankful for the active obedience of Christ. So if you recognize his last name, you may be familiar with Pat's brother, who was at Deeply Rooted Conference this past November, Mike Abendroth. So they have a very similar speaking style, writing style. They're brothers. They have similar theology. So let's go into the book. We'll try to get through a good chunk of the information in here because it's an important book it's a nice easy short book it's got a lovely cover says the active obedience of christ now let's see let's dig in starts out in the introduction given a quote from rc sproul talking about how the word evangelical doesn't really mean a whole lot anymore. It could mean somebody super liberal, somebody conservative, somebody believes the Bible, somebody doesn't believe the Bible, and just somebody that shows up to a church once every six months. So he said imputationalist may mean more. We go by the word imputationalist. Why? What's that mean? Well, the imputed righteousness of Christ to our account. There's a series of sermons that um, S. Lewis Johnson did several, several years ago. It was three imputations. One, Adam's sin imputed to us. Two, our sin imputed to Christ. And three, Christ's righteousness imputed to us who believe, sola fide, faith alone, So those are good resources to go listen to. You can listen to them on the S. Lewis Johnson app. But um, we're going to be talking about that third idea, Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Are you going to find the active obedience of Christ when you look in the concordance of your Bible? No. Abendroth says in this, he said, word searchianity, and I like that phrase, word searchianity simply will not do and resemble something far more aligned with the Arianism of yesteryear than biblical orthodoxy. What's he mean? He's saying that if we do a search in our Bible for this word, we're not going to find it. Well, if you do a search in your Bible for the word Trinity, you're not going to find it. If you do a search in your Bible for a lot of phrases, things like the, uh, the, hypostatic union you're not going to find that in your bible but you find the concept are you going to find the covenant of redemption no you're not going to find that word that phrase but you see the concept in the bible so that's what he's getting at here justification this is abendroth says many have heard some well-meaning person Define justification as just as if I never sinned. Have y'all heard that before? I've heard it many, many times. But it only tells half the story. And let's see what Abendroth continues. He says, while it has a certain ring to it, and we are all looking to make things easier, simpler, he says, it is both patently false and evidences the need to know more about the act of obedience of Christ. To be justified is actually... To be declared perfectly righteous, which is to say justification is just as if I always and perfectly kept the law of God. Personally, exact, uh, eternal, perpetually, I don't remember the Pete, but anyway, it's we constantly obeyed. We perfectly obeyed. We didn't. 
but it's imputed to us by faith in Jesus Christ who did perfectly obey. Uh, chapter 1 goes on. It says, we need a working definition of the act of obedience and the passive obedience. It says, the passive obedience of Christ is in reference to suffering. And we talked in a previous episode about the humiliation of Christ. We looked at that through Spurgeon's Catechism and the scripture references therein. The passive obedience of Christ is in reference to suffering. The act of obedience is in reference to the positive upholding of God's law. What's that mean? His obedience. His obedience. To obey is his positive upholding of God's law. So we have two aspects of salvation in Christ, the work of Christ. The work of Jesus provides, this is a quote from Abendroth, for the believer, the removal of guilt for violation against God's law. We talked about that. That's the second thing from the S. Lewis Johnson series of sermons, the imputation of our sin to Christ. He bore our guilt, right? And it provides the positive fulfillment of what the law requires. That's that third imputation, Christ's righteousness to us. We do what is required by God's law only in so much as we are joined to Christ. The removal of guilt, the provision of righteousness. That's the two parts of this imputation to us. We have all been imputed with Adam's righteousness, right? Or lack of righteousness. Adam's sin imputed to us, to our account. He's our federal head. Well, by faith, when the Spirit supernaturally makes us born again, unites us to Christ, we, at that moment, have the righteousness of Christ credited to our account and our sin credited to his account. What is not meant, this is Abram Roth, is that the life of Jesus was active obedience and the death was passive. I'll admit, when I used to hear this term, this phrase, I kind of, that's what I thought. So uh, through the years, I've understood it's not just life, active, death, passive. No, in his death, he was also actively obeying. Remember, passive refers to suffering. Active refers to upholding. A lot of people use the term, we're coming up on Easter, that week that starts really um, from uh, Palm Sunday as the Passion of Christ, right? The, the movie, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of Christ. Well, what that's really referring to is this passion, this passive refers to his suffering, the suffering of Christ. The passion doesn't mean he just had all warm, fuzzy feelings. It doesn't mean he had butterflies in his belly. No, it meant that it was his suffering, the week of suffering. But in actuality, the suffering of Christ, the passion of Christ, the passive obedience of Christ was his entire life. Being born as a man, being born as in humble conditions, being born in a stable or in a guest room, however you want to interpret that, but being laid in a manger, living as one of us, as the second member of the Godhead, wrapping on human flesh, his entire life was suffering, passive obedience. So, we now move to a wonderful quote. John Cahoon, and it's spelled C-O-L-Q-U-H-O-U-N. This has been the, the year of John Cahoon because Reformation Heritage republished his work, the, A Treatise on the Law and Gospel. So this is going to be all over the place, we hope. Um, we gave copies of this away at the Deeply Rooted Conference at G3 this past year. They gave copies away. Now you can go online and order copies of John Cahoon's book for free. You can get up to 10 copies from Reformation Heritage. They'll even pay to ship them to you. So guys I listen to on PresbyCast, they've got something called the Machin Horn. Maybe we're going to have to come up with the Cahoon Bell, right? Every time Cahoon's mentioned, we hear 
a bell ring. So, John Cahoon, this is a quote from him, from that very book that I just referenced, you can get for free. If, uh, if you're local and you need a copy, you didn't get a copy at Deeply Rooted this year, and you don't have the internet maybe and can't order a free one, let me know. I've got a few copies left over. So, John Cahoon, Christ's satisfaction for sin could not render his perfect obedience to the precept unnecessary, nor could his perfect obedience make his satisfaction for sin by suffering the penalty unnecessary. Because it was not of the same kind, the one is that which answers the law's demand of perfect obedience. Remember, the standard of the law is perfect obedience. Not what many people today will say, well, I tried. Well, I tried means I'm damned. I trust means I have righteousness of Christ. But it's I trust in the one who did perfectly obey. So, the one is which answers the law's demand of perfect obedience as the ground of title to eternal life. The other is that which answers its demand of complete satisfaction to divine justice. That is what Cahoon, that's Cahoon's whole book wrapped up in a phrase. Cahoon continues, The law as a covenant requires doing for life. The curse of that law demands dying as the punishment of sin. And by the time this podcast comes out, it, will already be Monday probably. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow, the Lord's day that I'll be preaching on this very topic. It's about the letter kills and the spirit gives life. And then Sunday evening, we're going to follow that up. So we'll be second Corinthians one through six in the morning, or we were, if you're listening to this on Monday, when it'll be posted. And then 7 through 11, we're following up that same idea of this perfect demand of the law brings death, but the free gift of God brings life. Aha, here we go. J. Gresson Machen, we have this quote. I don't have a Machen horn. I only have a Cahoon bell. So we're looking at the act of obedience of Christ by Pat Abendroth. And Machen says this, during every moment of his life upon earth, Christ was engaged in his passive obedience. We talked about that a little bit already. All humiliation, all suffering. In that previous episode I mentioned, episode four is on the humiliation of Christ. Talks about his entire life was that suffering. His death was the crown of his active obedience, is what Machen says. He merited eternal life for those who, whom he came to save. He had a specific objective. The father chose before time began. The son in time comes, redeems those people. The spirit in time applies that application. This pactum salutis before time began, that this covenant of redemption, that it was a triune act. Every salvation is an act of the triune God. Father, choose son redeems spirit applies we are just only in christ the pronouncement of god this is more from abend the pronouncement of god that sinners are righteous before him is actually based upon something very real the very real vicarious obedience to the law by jesus vicarious That is an important word. What's it mean? He was in our place, a substitute. He lived for us. He lived in our place. And that is imputed to us by faith, the work of the Spirit. Ah, we have a Spurgeon quote. Oh, this is just the trifecta we've got going here. We had John Cahoon. We had J. Gresham Machen. And now we've got Spurgeon. So if there's a... Machen horn, and there's now a Cahoon bell. What does Spurgeon get? Does Spurgeon get a whistle? So maybe we'll have to get a whistle every time we quote Spurgeon. But anyway, Spurgeon said this. 
Justification by faith is the surface soil. But then, imputed righteousness is the granite rock which lies underneath it. Now, is Spurgeon saying that justification is not that big a deal? No, justification is a huge deal. But underneath our justification is the work of Christ, the granite rock of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Why? Well, it's what what is your faith in? The fervency of your faith doesn't save you. It's the object of your faith. I could have faith that this microphone here is going to save me. Well, that's a stupid faith because it's not. There are a lot of people who have ill-placed faith. Oh, I'm a person of faith. Yes, I, I believe in faith. Yes, I, I believe whatever I want to believe is really what people are saying. No, it's faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the one who perfectly obeyed. That's the granite rock, and that's what Spurgeon's getting at here. So, <clears throat> I don't know if we'll get to hit all the high points that I wanted here, but we'll keep looking through it. Um, chapter 2 says, The ignorance about what God requires can only lead to ignorance about what Jesus provides. That's a wonderful quote. Why? Because when we want to lower the level of the law, what happens? Then we lower the level of what Jesus did. So if we say, well, he accepts my best efforts as a covenant, as keeping the covenant. Yeah, I try really hard. Well, what what's he going to do? He's saying, I'm sorry, your efforts are not going to get you into heaven. Your efforts will not bring you into my favorable presence. Why? Because he requires perfection. We lower the standard of the law. We lower what Christ has done. We need a perfect law keeper, not just someone who tried really hard. When I'm picking players for a basketball team, now there may be some kids that try really, really hard. Well, no matter how hard they try, if they're two foot nothing and don't know how to dribble, I'm not picking them. They might try as hard as they can. No, I'm going to pick the kid who does the best on the team. And that is our salvation. When we are trusting in Christ, we're trusting in the one who did everything perfectly. He's 10 for 10 from the free throw line. He is 100% from three-point uh, three range. He has never missed, not a single time. And that is why he is the only one sufficient to be a substitute for us. We need Jesus, more from Pat Amendroth, we need Jesus to be truly man, just as much as we need him to be truly God. And these, this goes back to the ancient creeds. He was truly man and truly God. Uh, I know I've said in the past, some people say, I'm not going to correct them on this, fully God, fully man, but the historic phrase would be truly God and truly man. He must be truly God or he cannot be a mediator between God and man. He must be truly man, same reason, cannot be a true mediator. He must represent us. He must be like us in every single way. And this is just such an important piece of theology for us to grasp that he must be a real man. Some people will say he wasn't really a man. And we've got several episodes looking at B.B. Warfield's book, uh, the, uh, the emotional life of our Lord. And that hammers home his true humanity. Um, but yeah, here we are. We are in, we're on page 29 of the book, 20, 28 and 29. If you have your own copy and you should have your own copy, it's a very helpful book. Um, for me, I'll say it wasn't earth shattering because these are all doctrines and topics that I've come to understand mainly through listening to uh, some podcasts like The Pactum, Pat Abendroth and Mike Grimes, uh, listening to No Compromise Radio, uh, Mike Abendroth. Another podcast that helps with this is Theocast. That's good. But now you can add another podcast to that list 
Ambassador Radio helps you with this as well. So, we're looking at this. Romans 2.13. This is the litmus test if you understand how the book of Romans is ordered and if you understand the difference in law and gospel and if you understand the act of obedience of Christ. Litmus test time. Let's see if you pass or fail. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Uh-oh. Is that true? Well, of course it's true. It's in the Bible, right? But what's the context? Think of where you find this in Scripture. Where is this found in the book of Romans? Well, it's in chapter 2, isn't it? Chapter 2 is law. It is revealing to us how we have failed. How chapters 1 through the first part of 3, it's basically Jews have failed, Gentiles have failed, people under the law have failed, Adam has failed, we all fail. So here, yes, it's true. If you are a doer of the law, you will be justified. But you must be a perfect doer of the law. That is what Paul is getting at. He wants us to be damned in the courtroom of our heart before he gets to the good news. Before he gets to what Jesus has provided. Yes, of course, Romans 2.13 is true. But read it in the right context. Abendral says this, No one who has Adam as his or her representative meets the requirements. The only hope sinners have of being justified by God is for the requirement to be met by another, namely Jesus Christ. Here he quotes John Calvin on that very passage of Romans 2.13. They who pervert this passage for the purpose of building up justification by works deserve most fully to be laughed at even by children. And that's true. To laugh at your poor doctrine even by children, Calvin said. Why? Because it is so important to understand. We, yes, if we could perfectly do the law, we would be justified. God would say, welcome in, my good and faithful servant. You have done everything perfectly, but that's impossible for the children of Adam. And that's why Calvin says, laugh at people. Anyone in Adam, no. Nobody in Adam can perfectly obey. Nobody in Adam can do the law to be justified. That's the difference in the law as a covenant and the law as a God. So, the point being, we need to understand when we're reading in Scripture, where we're reading in Scripture, what is the context. Calvin says, laugh at anyone if they say the doers of the law will be justified, meaning that very thing, that it is possible for any child of Adam. The commonly understood, another quote here, the commonly understood meaning of righteousness is the legal act of doing what God requires, right? Right? In other words, righteousness is adherence to the law. We must have perfect adherence to the law or else we are damned, right? If you don't do everything that is required in the law, right? That's what the Bible teaches. Deuteronomy, Galatians. If you don't do everything that is required in the law, then you are damned. All right, let's keep going. The only way sinful humans could ever be accepted by God would be for God to provide a unique representative who was truly human, we already talked about that, like those, he would represent and perfectly meet the strict obligation of obeying the law. The strict obligation. Strict, yes, very strict. It must be perfect, right? That is why Jesus is such a wonderful Savior. That is why our hope rests in him and in him alone. So we see some scripture references here that we're going to look through. Because if we just make up a doctrine and we talk about it all day long, that profits nothing. If we don't have scripture that teaches us, everything must be based in scripture. Our confession at Bass is based on scripture. We have scripture reference after scripture reference. The catechism book we use, scripture reference after scripture reference, explaining why we believe what we believe about the Bible. Matthew chapter 5. That's another good litmus test. Matthew 5 through 7. 
is this Jesus telling people this is how you to live in order to please God to get into heaven? Or is he saying, you haven't done these things. You must trust in me. You must look to me. All right, let's look. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus boldly proclaims that he himself is the one who fulfills the requirement of righteousness. Is that true? Is that false? Is he saying, blessed are the meek? Saying, well, if you're meek enough, you'll get to heaven. Is he saying, blessed are the poor in spirit? Well, if you're poor in spirit enough, you're going to get to heaven. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that you are spiritually bankrupt. And you need someone to fill up the bank. You need someone to deposit an infinite amount of righteousness on your account. And by faith alone, Jesus is the one. It says here, only his representative obedience could secure justification and eternal life. That is the point of the Sermon on the Mount. Only his obedience. Because ours is a less than sufficient act of obedience. Even our best works are but glorified sins. I don't remember who said that, but it's a good quote. Why? Now we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3. Why did Jesus insist on being baptized, given that he himself never sinned? Well, that's a good question. Is it just that he wanted to have a little fun, get, get in the water, get wet, play with his cousin John the Baptist? No. It says specifically in verse 15, to fulfill all righteousness. Well, did that add to Jesus' righteousness? No, but he was acting as a representative. So he did these things representatively. That is the point that Avondroth is making in the book here. And that's the point that Matthew made. And that's the point that Jesus made. That he was doing this as an act of obedience to represent everyone who would ever trust in him. Romans 5, Romans 5, 19 says by the one man's righteousness, or no, sorry, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is federal headship. The covenant of Adam drove us all into condemnation. The covenant of the new covenant of Jesus, that is what brings us life. Obedience secures righteousness. Therefore, sinners desperately need the perfect obedience of another, namely Jesus. This is so important that we understand that we are looking to Christ. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 12? Look to the author and finisher or author and perfecter of faith. A lot of times it's in it's included in there of our faith, depending on what translation you're reading. But of faith, it's really of faith. It is because of what Jesus does representatively as a human for humans that believing sinners can stand righteous before God. That is the only way we can stand before God. Church history is also a testament. So we have a scripture testament, a testimony. We have church history's testimony. Church history, Protestant, <clears throat> excuse me, Protestant confessional standards affirming the act of obedience of Christ include, but maybe you're not limited to, the Lutheran Book of Concord, the Belgic Confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Savoy Declaration, the Second London Baptist Confession. I think that's pretty, pretty extensive list. Now, of course, we know the last of these is the Cadillac of all confessions, right? The Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Well, why? Because that's Bass Chapel's confession. But all of these historic Protestant confessions agree to this. The Heidelberg Catechism asks this, How are you righteous before God? The answer? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Although my conscience accuses me, that I have grievously sinned against all God's commands. Yet God imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. Praise the Lord for that. As if I had never, ever, 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 ever committed any sin. I may have added a few words in there. But 
as if I myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ has rendered for me. Those two words are really how you can sum up the act of obedience of Christ. For me. Jesus obeyed his parents. For me. Jesus obeyed the law of Moses. For me. Jesus was baptized. For me. Jesus went to the cross. For me. Jesus allowed sinful men to nail him there. For me. That is Christianity. It is Jesus for me. Jesus in my place. Puritan Thomas Goodwin. Paul speaks of Adam and Jesus as if there had never been any more men in the world because these two between them had all the rest of the sons of men hanging in their girdle. That's true. Every man is either in Adam or in Christ. In Adam brings death. In Christ means life eternal. John Bunyan perhaps the greatest preacher that you have never heard. I hope you've heard of him. You know, John Bunyan in the Big Blue Ox, right? No, not that Bunyan. That's Paul Bunyan. John Bunyan was the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, the second best-selling book of all time after the Bible. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, there's a lot of children's versions of Pilgrim's Progress. There's a cartoon movie version that was put out a few years ago. Or you can read, there's modern English versions of Pilgrim's Progress. So if you haven't read it, at least try to watch the movie. It's good. Um, But, hey, and locally here coming up soon, a local Christian play uh, group is going to be putting on a production of Pilgrim's Progress. So, you know, go watch that. There, and additionally... John Bunyan was John Owen's favorite preacher. Y'all hopefully know John Owen as we're working through his book, The Glory of Christ, on our Saturday group when we go meet at Randall's and have breakfast and study about the glory of Christ. And that group started another nice connection here. The very first book we did was Sexual Fidelity by Mike Abendroth, Pat Abendroth's brother. But nonetheless, here we go. Back to John Bunyan. There is no other way for sinners to be justified from the curse of the law in the sight of God than by the imputation of that righteousness long ago performed by and still residing with the person of Jesus Christ. John Bunyan, the best. Here we go. R.C. Sproul. Back to R.C. Sproul. Well, we had the machin horn, we had the Cahoon bell, we talked about a Spurgeon whistle. Maybe the R.C. Sproul would be a can of Coke, Diet Coke being popped open. Uh, R.C. Sproul loved to drink Diet Coke, so maybe we'll we'll get some sound effects in here as the budget increases for Ambassador Radio. Anyway, if we take away active obedience of Jesus... We take away the imputation of his righteousness to us. If we take away the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us, we take away justification by faith alone. If we take away justification by faith alone, we take away the gospel. And we are left in our sins. Amen, R.C. Very good. Now, Pat on this, he didn't just give you all of the positive affirmations of the act of obedience of Christ, there are people who would reject the act of obedience of Christ. So chapter 5 is about objections. Objection. Too much assurance? That sounds very Roman Catholic, right? But yeah, that's a rejection. A lot of people would say too much assurance. Say it's unnecessary. Well, let's see what he says about it being unnecessary. If God helps those who've helped themselves, I love that he threw this in there. Uh, that's a one of the Christian cliches that needs to die. God helps those who help themselves. No, we are all helpless. We are hopeless apart from him. We are dead on the bottom of the ocean. We are a corpse and we need to be rescued 
and we need to have new life breathed into us. It's not just that we need a little bit of help. He's, God's got to do the whole thing. If God helps those who help themselves, if he grades on a curve, or if he merely requires that our reasonable efforts outweigh our bad, then no one needs the act of obedience of Christ. In other words, if God does not require perfect righteousness, then there is no need for the substitutionary perfect law keeper, which is to say Christ's active obedience. It's been said before. I don't remember who said it. Probably an Abendroth if I'm quoting it. But the point being, if all we needed was Jesus' death, boom, he just comes down, Good Friday, gets crucified, raises up on Sunday. But no, we needed his active obedience. We needed his life of obedience. We needed him to be like us in every way, yet succeed where we failed. Justification by faithfulness. This is a big problem in Christianity to misconstrue faith and faithfulness. I mentioned Theocast earlier. They've got a little ebook called Faith versus Faithfulness. So that would be a good resource to look at to differentiate faith and faithfulness. Faith, fide. Faithfulness, fidelis. Right? You think of the Marines. Pastor Dave was a Marine. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Well, truly, Jesus is the only one who was Semper Fidelis. With all due apologies to the Marines, Jesus is the only one who was Semper Fidelis. Let's see what Avondale says here. Those who advocate one form or another of justification by faithfulness or faith plus works will not affirm the act of obedience of Christ. Why? Because if it is one little tiny bit of me, I don't need him to obey. If his death just gets me back to zero, then I'm in charge of living positively toward the law of God, and that keeps me justified? Yeah, but what's the problem? I don't. Paul said, as a Christian, O oh, wretched man that I am. He didn't say, oh, wretched man that I used to be. No, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. In the Christian life, we sin still every single day. Thus, we need someone who lived righteously every single day as our substitute. Well, there's a fear of antinomianism. A lot of people who understand the gospel truly and rightly are accused of antinomianism. Paul was accused of antinomianism. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means. Well, well how are your people going to obey if you don't force them to do it this way? That's Rome. That's Roman theology, Roman doctrine. That is not Christian doctrine. We are motivated to obey because of the kindness of God. <clears throat> excuse me, we are motivated because God is so kind, because we have been given such a great gift, not because we're afraid God's going to whack us, but because he whacked his son on our behalf. Now we are motivated to obey out of gratitude. Valid, this is Amon Roth, valid motivation can only come from gratitude as the spirit works. Do we trust the Holy Spirit? Sometimes we act like we don't. I know I don't. I get impatient with myself. I get impatient with other people. My sanctification isn't progressing as much as I think it should. Well, guess what? God is the author of sanctification as much as he is the author of justification. And I need to look to him. He is growing me in my lack of sanctification to make me more sanctified. And I know that seems oxymoronic in our brains, but that is truly how he does it. He allows us to appreciate the righteousness of the sin as we are slowly mortifying sin, as he is convicting us more and more of our sin that remains in us. I've probably said this a thousand times. When you first got saved, you knew you were a sinner but you probably didn't realize the depth of your sin. You've been a Christian for 20 years. You're like, oh, wow, 
man, that stuff that I used to do was really bad, but you know, the stuff that I'm still doing is even worse. Why? Because I know more and more of my Lord Jesus and what he has done for me. And that sin that I didn't even realize was there a long time ago, I see it now and it kills me all the more. That is me appreciating Christ. If God just made us perfectly sanctified at the moment of our justification, would we have this glory to give to Christ of understanding more and more what he has done actively for us, what he has done in obeying for us, in the fact that he never smarted off to somebody, the fact that he never had malice towards someone, just those simple things that we don't even maybe realize. Um, but we need that, and we need that appreciation. And there are different versions, and I'm just going to kind of jump to the end here. I'm not going to read the whole book for you. Come on. But there is an appendix that uh, I read. You will want to look at that. But let's just jump to the conclusion. Richard Belcher Jr. is not exaggerating when he says, If not for Christ's act of obedience and righteousness, receive through faith alone, no one would receive eternal life. I think we've made that point over and over again. Augustus Hopkins Strong said, Neither Christ's act of obedience alone, nor Christ's obedient passion alone, can save us. We need both the active and passive obedience of Christ. We need him to suffer for us, but we need him to perfectly obey for us. And I, I love this quote. It's near the end. Talking about Micah 6 8. What is Micah 6 8? It is, He has told you, old man, what is good to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That is a wonderful Bible verse. It is absolutely true. And people have put it on t shirts and say, Go on. Love God and love people. That's really what it's saying. He's saying, keep the whole Ten Commandments. Love God, love people. Well, have we done justice? Nope, but Jesus has. Have we loved kindness? No, but Jesus has. Have we walked humbly with our God? No, but Jesus has on our behalf. Praise the Lord. The quote specifically, Jesus and Jesus alone is truly the Micah 6, 8 man. For he and he alone is good. And has done what the Lord requires to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Yes, praise the Lord. And we'll close out with that J. Gresham Machen quote. It is so wonderful. I am thankful for the act of obedience of Christ. No hope without it. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ the righteous is indeed our only sure hope. I hope. Pat Avendroth doesn't get mad for me reading so much of this book to you guys here in the podcast, but don't worry. The only people listening are my mom and probably the wife and kids. When we're driving to church one day, I'll force them to listen to this as well. But y'all have a great week. If the Lord wills it, we'll see you at Bass Chapel. <laughs>